again. I'm Nick Hennigan and, well, it's May, isn't it? Uh, this is episode eight, chapter eight of How to Make a Crisis Out of a Drama, the Mava book uh, that we wrote as a stream of consciousness back in 1997 when things were a bit topsy-turvy for us. Uh, so uh, I thought I'd, I won't go into why I'm doing all this. You, you know it. Again, thank you so much for your kind comments. Uh, really nice to hear from you all. Well, from you all, from a lot of people. Um, and of course, you know, these diaries were written late at night. It's quite late now. What is it now? It's about one o'clock in the morning, you know, relatively early. Quite often I would write until five in the morning. I used to write overnight back in the Birmingham days with a few cheeky beers. There are no pubs open at the moment. So I just thought I'd join myself for a, Quick bar. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wow. Kids, it's not big. Pardon me. And it's certainly not clever. Okay, let's get back to it. Saturday, the 24th of May, 1997. <clears throat> Doing the script workshops has got me back on the writing trail for a ghost of a chance. I've obviously done the first draft already. That's what won the awards, but I've got to tighten it up now and think about the characters. But it's a man and his son. So I'm writing a part of a 13-year-old kid and it sort of has strange effects on you. Or what it does me at any rate. It's always been a bit of a problem when I've been writing or directing. Perhaps it makes for an interesting life. I can't help but kind of get into the things I'm doing. When I directed a production of Words of Gummage a few years ago, it was only an amateur uh, uh, production and I was still at BRMB Radio in Birmingham and doing a disco at a cocktail bar in Stratford-upon-Avon three nights a week called the Actors Bar by the way at the Hilton Hotel. Prophetic eh? Mm. For some time when I was directing Wells of Gummidge I couldn't actually drive past farms or ploughed fields to get to Stratford-upon-Avon without being moved by it. Really. I mean, it sounds crazy, but emotionally, I was with Wurzel and Art Sally. And when I saw these farmyards, it was their house. Oh, and talking to Art Sally, by the way, I met Eunice Stubbs, the definitive television Art Sally, a couple of weeks ago. Thankfully, she's a lovely person. Really nice and genuine. I mean, thank God. I don't know how I would have coped if, uh, if, uh, if Eunice Stubbs had been anything else. And she's also a stunning actress. I mean, God willing, I'll hire her one day. And when I was writing Henry V, Lion of England, I was actually driving through uh, Monmouthshire in Wales. Now, Henry V was born in Monmouth. It was a real thrill to look at the area where he grew up. It kind of moved me. Now, whether this all means I'm destined for a hospital or not, I have no idea. Maybe should I ever receive any acclaim for me writing, new writers will hang on me every word. Although I do remember being told with Henry V uh, Lion of England at Edinburgh in 1992 by a young uh, Oxbridge journalist who worked for one of the Oxford University papers. He seemed to think I'd be very famous when I'm dead. Anyway, I'll uh, see what happens. Anyway, as I now accept, as does my girlfriend, that when the odd writing bug bites, it bites. Rebecca's learned to ignore my strange, wistful mood when there's a play on. So, back to Ghost of a Chance. I'm trying to write the part for a 13-year-old. So, what do I do? How do you research being 13? Well, obviously, videos are a good starting point. I caught, by accident, a film on Channel 5 called This Boy's Life. It's the true story of the boyhood of the award-winning writer Tobias Wolfe. It stars Robert De Niro, Ellen Barkin and Leonardo DiCaprio, who, at the time of writing, is playing Romeo in the film Romeo and Juliet. Excuse me. This Boy's Life is a brilliant film that manages totally to avoid slipping into cliché. Then I got the boy buddy movie Stand By Me from the best video shop in Birmingham. Cinephilia in Moseley. They're great, real enthusiasts. Try walking into your local blockbuster and saying, I'm trying to write a part for a 13-year-old boy. What you got? Without so much as a flicker. The bloke behind the counter in Cinephilia whipped out the Time Out movie guide and I came away with a couple of treasures. I'd better watch them now. Oh no, wait till Monday. It's a bank holiday, so the rest of the world will go to sleep. Sunday, the 25th of May, 1997. <clears throat> I watched the Spanish Grand Prix. Damon Hill hardly warrants a mention now. Can't remember who won, because I'm sure he drives for Frank Williams who booted Damon Hill out of the team. 
I met Glenn Bays, our homegrown director who's moved to London to try and involve him in A Ghost of a Chance. Also met up later with Greg Hobbs and Louise Chamberlain, our two brilliant actors from same time next year. Like everyone who's been involved with Maverick to date, I really owe them. We booze at the Billsley and then fall out to Kings Heath High Street for a curry with Steve, another member of the Stage 2 youth group. He's now 16, looks 22 and has done since he was 12. I wash me England shirt in preparation for a crucial World Cup qualifier against Poland next week. Bank Holiday Monday, 26th of May, 1997. I watched the films I got from Cinephilia and in Stand By Me got very moved by a doomed kid called River Phoenix playing the part of a doomed kid called Chris. But I'm not Stephen King writing about Castle Rock, USA. I'm me writing a part for a local kid. Hmm, there's only one thing for it. I jumped into my car. Oh, I don't always use my girlfriend's mother's car, by the way. Only for trips of more than three miles. And trips where I need to be relatively sure of arriving. You see, I have a Rover, which I bought from the car auctions for £280. It's just a real lottery as to whether it will start or not. Anyway, today it did start, so I decided to track down my roots, man. Want to know what it's like to be 13? Go back to the places you were when you were 13. See the area you spent your youth in. Now, fortunately, especially given my car, I don't have very far to go to do this thing. In fact, my emotional alma mater is about 10 minutes from where I now live in Highbury Road. But I haven't been that way for many years, and it's not a through route anywhere for me. I moved to London for a few years, and when I came back to work in Birmingham for BRB Radio, it seemed completely natural to return to King's Heath. Anyway, forgive this self-indulgence, but maybe one day you may want to create a 13-year-old child. This method had the desired effect. So, fortunately for me, given the rover, I was born in the front upstairs bedroom of a council house at 154 Hollybank Road, King's Heath, Birmingham, not long after Elvis Presley became very famous. My best mate, Pete James, lived in Ardencote Road. I went to Wheelers Lane Junior and Infant School, then to Wheelers Lane Boys School. We played on Billsley Common, and I remember the RAF air shows they used to hold every other year until a Harrier crashed in France or something. It's a beautiful sunny day, just the sort of weather you need when route tracking. And it has, I have to admit, stirred a certain nostalgia. I'm actually writing this in the aforementioned Rover car outside my birthplace, on my laptop. The appearance, appearance of the house has changed somewhat. It's much smarter. There are now modern windows and a new porch. Our original porch fell off when I was around 14. I think someone was swinging on it. And then when the Hennigan clan moved there before I was born, I guess sometime in the mid-50s, the estate was still surrounded by fields. But they've all gone now, and flats were built opposite our house. The first stirrings of the old adolescent memory banks is provoked by those flats. In one of those flats lived a girl. I think her name was Jane, let's call her that. And she very kindly gave me my very first sexual experience. And what an experience it was, thank you very much. She was really nice, and if memory serves me correctly, she went to King Edward's Camp Hill School. She was certainly the first member of the opposite sex I felt I could actually talk to. We could see each other's bedroom windows, so we'd use torches to signal each other. It was another way of learning Morse code. One night, after our folks had gone to bed, we flashed three times, snuck out of the house and met on the monkey bars by the common. We spent an hour kissing. She just kind of muttered encouragement and then we both returned to our houses. It was a big deal at the time, I can tell you. The monkey bars have gone now. Maybe they weren't safe enough. Thankfully, they couldn't talk either. So I parked my car outside my old house in Hollyback Road and I took a walk around my old haunts onto Billsley Common. It still seems to be a relatively quiet area, although parts of the estate are now looking tired and old, and there's a burnt out car where the monkey bars used to be. I notice it's now on a bus route too, albeit the buses are single deckers. It was a strange walk. It was a perfect, lazy, warm spring day. There were flecks of white clouds in the sky and a cooling breeze that tugged gently at my t-shirt. The sounds of crows cawing 
were reminiscent of the old Hollybank farm torn down to make way for our council estate. And I remembered that as a boy, there was always the sound of birdsong interrupted by the passage of the occasional car. I looked at the downstairs window of our old house where Fiona, my younger sister, and I used to stand on the window ledge and wait desperately for our older sister, Jenny, to come home from Swansea School across the common. Jenny left Hollybank Road to go to Australia with her husband when I was about 11. I remember her tears as she walked out the front door for the last time. Fiona and me couldn't understand the fuss as we'd been told we'd see her the following day before she left. The next day arrived and Mum told us Jenny had had to leave for Australia early so we wouldn't get to see her. It was, of course, a white lie. We knew that instantly, but we accepted it. Our parents had told us a white lie about Jenny leaving to save us from any emotional upset. I guess that's the sort of thing you do as a parent and it certainly worked for us. Me and Fiona accepted that Jenny had gone and we got on with our lives. We may have been more perturbed if we had known that we were going to have to wait a quarter of a century before we ever saw her again. The nostalgia continued. I walked over to where my dad used to rent a lock-up garage when we eventually got a car. I couldn't remember which garage it was, but I remember sunny afternoons when I'd helped dad fix the car. An oil change was a big deal. He once had to change the entire engine in our old Wolseley 444, and that was a huge task, requiring both me and my older brother Bob struggling with a hired chain hoist to remove the engine block. It was far too expensive to get done in a garage. I don't know if it worked or not. I think it did, but the Wolseley was eventually sold for scrap. I remember now the feeling of violation as the scrapper truck punched a hole in the black shiny roof of the car and dumped it on the flatbed. Flat bed, sorry. It drove off with an almost obscene casualness. That noble carriage that had carried the family Hennigan on many a summer holiday to Wales. There was a cricket game taking place on Billsley Common. I actually got into the school cricket team once through two lucky balls. I ran two batsmen out, one after the other, with what looked like consummate skill but was in fact a total and complete fluke. I was dropped from the team after just one game. <clears throat> Excuse me. From the common, I walked over Hollybank Road to what we used to call the woods. It is, in fact, a little oblong area of trees around a stream. We used to have a rope hanging from a branch to swing over the stream. The copse looked green and peaceful, but surprise, surprise, much smaller than I remembered it. The trees still seemed the same, but the path which used to be muddied and crossed with tree roots was now covered in wood chip and is much more civilised. We used to catch eels in the stream and regularly observe water voles, or were they rats? I doubt there's anything alive in there now, though, apart from the rats, perhaps. It's now barely a trickle and host to a number of beer cans and crisp packets. I couldn't find our swing, or even the place where we used to play. The undergrowth is much thicker now. But it was nearly 25 years ago, so what did I expect? Having just seen the film Stand By Me, which is full of New England vistas, the woods in Hollybank Road seemed somewhat pathetic, but the shadows of my past were strongly present. They were, after all, in spite of their lack of glamour, our woods. I walked past the hill where we used to play war. One of the older kids on the estate frightened us to death once by shooting real pellets from an air rifle he told us was not loaded. He was an odd one, all right. He once tied me to a tree and tried to make me pass out by exerting uh, pressure on my temples. The game got a bit too scary and eventually I talked him out of it and he let me go. I was 12 and he was about 16 and I never once wondered why he wanted me to pass out but again that's all part of being a kid. He wanted to play the same game at a later date but I refused so he gave me a black eye for my trouble. I returned home in tears and I think my dad made one of his regular trips over what used to be a field to talk to the older boy's dad. All part of being a kid. From the wood, I walked up Ardencote Road, past all the houses that used to be the dwellings of families we knew. On the council estate, they were all built the same, but we loved them. Mark Brandt, Ian Nichols, and my friend Peter James. He was an odd one, was Pete, a brilliant artist and writer. He eventually, I think, got a girl in trouble. We were best mates as we started secondary school, and then something happened, I don't know what, and he and a gang began bullying me. I had a couple of miserable years. My father's philosophy on bullying was to ignore it. You didn't fight back, you just walked away. 
Not perhaps the best way to survive a tough secondary modern school, but that's the way we were brought up. I think it may have had something to do with Dad's tough and I think quite violent upbringing as the son of an Irish labourer in Leeds. Plus his experiences in the last war at Arnhem. He lied about his age, he dropped at the biggest bridge, ran out of everything uh, and spent 18 months as a guest of Adolf Hitler in a prisoner of war camp. Spooky. They made a film of it called A Bridge Too Far. Anyone who sees A Ghost of a Chance will know my dad will be able to pick up where the fiction ends and the fact begins. But back nearly 30 years and Pete James. As suddenly as it began, the bullying stopped. We got a bit older and Pete grew up and suddenly realised that we were mates again. He apologised one day and we never spoke of the dark years, but we spoke plenty about other things. I got the impression that my folks were not too keen on him. He did have a bit of a reputation as a tearaway. But Pete and I used to talk about everything. It started with Monty Python's Flying Circus. This was a regular Thursday night ritual. I'd go around to Pete's because his mum had a television in the kitchen. Two tellies, there's posh. We'd make a cup of tea and then prepare the telly. We sat in the same place every week. Then Monty Python would begin in black and white. And we wouldn't speak for half an hour until it was over. A regular ritual. Then it would be an hour of going over the sketches and talking about the humour, which bits we liked and what we thought was not so good. We were around 14 and I think for the first time we started to realise that there was more to life than simple kids talk and trying to beat the system. We talked about trust and respect, about mental attitude, about human potential. But only when we were together. The rest of the time and at school with the other kids it was all tits and bums, the usual stuff. We also started talking about writing, about a creative itch we both knew we had but didn't know how to scratch. I have a definite philosophy on kids. In the intervening years since Pete and I were best friends, I've dealt with all sorts of children, from 13-year-old murderers to kids of landed gentry. And I know, absolutely, that the greatest shame about many children is that most of their potential is wasted. I'm on my fourth career, and I'm fed up that I've left it so late. But what fills me with sadness is that if I ever make any money or get any reputation out of writing, be it for Henry V Line of England or Shakespeare Adaptations or A Ghost of a Chance or whatever I'm going to produce over the next year or so, if the reviews continue to be good for Henry V Line of England, I'll always feel that Pete James had the potential to do better than me, had circumstances been different for him. I haven't seen Pete for over 10 years, but when I moved back to Birmingham from London, I hired him and his van to relocate me. B&B Radio, paid as part of a relocation package. Thanks, guys. Because of his domestic situation, Pete had given up any talk of further education and instead drove a van. After that, and this is a measure of the bloke, I had a dream about him four or five years later and I tracked him down to a taxi office in Birmingham. I'd seen him twice in 15 years and I phoned him up out of the blue and said, hello, remember me? It's Nick Hennigan. Um, I had a dream about you and I wondered if we could meet. It's a strange kind of phone call to get, isn't it? And I did wonder what if he'd just hang up on me. But straight away, without hesitation, Pete James said, yeah, of course, of course we should meet. It's like the rapport we developed during those school years was too strong to ignore. We met up and his domestic situation hadn't improved any. In fact, it got worse, I think. But in spite of the fact that we had uh, little in common nowadays, the two school kids that had gone through so much all those years ago were still there. Buried beneath adulthood, maybe, but still there below the surface. The last line of Stand By Me has Richard Dreyfus as the writer typing something like, I never again had friends like I had when I was 12 years old. Jesus, whoever does. It's struck a poignant note today. I don't know where Pete is now. I occasionally look in a phone book because I'd be fascinated to know if that report could have lasted this long. It was there 10 years ago. I really hope Pete is really successful and happy. I gather his mom passed away. The sad part of all of this is that as I walked up Ardencote Road today, I wasn't sure which was his house anymore. And even if I'd known, I probably wouldn't have had the guts to knock on the door and ask if Pete still lived there. Oh, P.S. I watched Lorenzo's Oil on BBC Two tonight. Bad move. What a film. I can't believe it's a true story. I felt like I did when I watched Live Aid a few years ago. How do parents cope? 